May I speak in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If I am asked, I will tell you that I really love to go camping. But if you ask anyone in my family, they will say, Dad really hates camping. And it's true that I wonder, especially in the summer in Oklahoma, why anyone would trade air conditioning and a bed for sleeping outside in the heat, on the ground, with the bugs. It makes no sense. And my friends who love camping tell me that I'm focusing on the wrong things, that camping is all about being in nature, away from civilization, away from noise and distractions. I recently heard a story about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, and they're forced to camp for the night. And they pitch a makeshift tent under the stars. And in the middle of the night, um, Holmes wakes Watson up. And he says, Watson, look up at the stars. Tell me, what can you deduce? And Watson says, well, I see millions of stars. Even if a few of those stars have planets, it's quite likely there are some planets like ours. And if there are a few planets like ours out there, there might also be life. And Holmes says, no, Watson, you idiot. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Sometimes we lose focus on the things that are most important. I know people who are passionate about their hobbies, like camping. Actually, sorry, my page. My pages got out of order. Um, you should always put page numbers on your sermon, okay? This was Jesus' message to the religious leaders. Keep your focus on the right thing. Every group, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, Zealots, they all had their unique agendas. And Jesus' message to each was the same. You've missed the most important things. For the last four Sundays, we've heard these groups questioning Jesus, trying to trap him in his words. And today their question was a common debate. Which is the most important of the 613 laws in the law of Moses? And Jesus' answer was not unique at all. The same answer could have been given by any representative from any of these groups. And it wasn't just an answer. Jesus was restating the prayer, the Shema, that um, was said every morning by um, Jewish people. This greatest command was the heart of what he had been teaching. Love God and love your neighbor because the kingdom of God is coming. And it's easy for us to lose focus on love. And the first reason this is true is because love forces us to focus on something or someone other than ourselves. Now the word love is interesting in this reading. If I, I want you to know that I love my Aunt Darla, but I have never dreamed about going to my aunt and saying, Aunt Darla, I love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That would be odd. Maybe I should do that sort of thing. Jesus is telling us, though, this is how we are to love God. We are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I, know, I don't know exactly what this means, but I can tell you this sounds like passionate love. What are you passionate about? I know many people, there's a page now, we're back to it, who are passionate about their hobbies, like camping. And it's easy to tell what you're passionate about because it's the things you spend your time doing and thinking about. 
There is a time in my life when I was passionate about golf. My ninth and 10th grade years of high school, especially in the summer, I played golf every single day, sometimes twice a day, not always on Sunday, but the other six days of the week, twice a day. When I was younger than that, I really wanted to be a cartoonist. And so every day I cut out the funny section from the newspaper. And I had a folder that I saved it in. I punched a hole in it, saved it in the folder. And then on Sundays, the Tulsa World had a separate magazine for the funnies. And I would put them together and make a book. And when I got about this thick, I'd, I'd start a new book. And I did that until it looked like I had a, about 300 newspapers piled under my bed. And my dad said, this is a fire hazard. <laughs> you have to get rid of these. The best definition that I can think of, though, about passion is my dog, Luna. If our family is eating dinner, especially pizza, and I have crust on my plate, Luna sits there, her eyes wide open, every muscle ready to move, drool forming at the edges of her mouth, staring with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength at that little piece of crust on my plate. And I have never focused on anything in my life with such devotion and passion as Luna on a piece of pizza crust. So what does loving God with all of your heart soul, mind, and strength look like? How much time and effort does it take? How much concentration? How much focus? Jesus is telling us this morning that is the point. If you only get one thing right, get this right. But the problem is I don't know how to do that. This is difficult. If the Pharisees aren't doing this, who is? I mean, they would have told you they love God. And their passion and their dedication are obvious. They tried to follow the exact letter of the law and their question points to the difficulty of doing that. Which is the greatest command? How do we know which to preference above others? Because this is a hard system to figure out. And I sympathize with the Pharisees because there was a time in my life when my spiritual goal was just to get everything right, to do everything scripture commanded me to do. It was the most important thing to me. And if you think, if you find yourself in that position, if you think that to be acceptable to God, you have to get everything right, then there is no way that you will not have a problem with your neighbor who is not also trying to do it. And there is no way you won't live your life in fear. Because you cannot get everything right. You can't. And I think this is the big reason why we often forget to focus on love. During this time in my life, I thought loving God meant that I should do exactly what the Pharisees and Herodians and Sadducees were doing with Jesus for the last four weeks, arguing. And I thought being right and proving that I was right and knowing the truth so that I could prove people wrong was more important than loving my neighbor who was made in God's image. I knew the Bible and that was the place I pitched my tent. And it's really a comfortable feeling to believe you're right, to believe you have it all figured out, and once you get that feeling, you don't really need much faith at all. 
But the problem is life hits. Doubts come. And like Holmes and Watson in the story, we're suddenly confronted with the bigness and the enormity and the magnificence and the chaos of creation. And it's messy. And easy answers don't work. If we want to know that our focus has wavered or settled on the wrong thing, we have to hear the second part of Jesus' command. And this goes back to my, my problem, the thing I couldn't figure out. Because Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we only had the first part of this, we'd be stuck. Because I can't tell you what cert with certainty what loving God means. But I can tell you what it doesn't mean because I have that second part. Love for God won't put an agenda before people. Love for God will not treat my neighbor like they are not made in God's image. Love for God does not despise, does not hate, does not ridicule. Loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength means that we're wise enough to realize that none of us are smart enough or wise enough to gain a perfect understanding of scripture or knowledge of truth that will ever leave us completely free from doubt. It, it doesn't mean loving a book or a system of rules so much that it's replacing God. That's called idol worship. See, the truth is not a book, but a person. And that person in whom we found, find truth told us the greatest commandment is love God and love your neighbor. The most memorable camping trip I've ever been on was just after we moved to Shawnee with the Emanuel Cub Scout troop. Some of you in this room were there. It was at the Ford family farm. It was a father-son camp out. And it was memorable because in the middle of the night, the temperature unexpectedly dropped about, at least unexpected, unexpectedly to me, about 30 degrees. And it rained, just like last night. Unlike last night, we had, about, we had intense straight line winds of about 30 miles per hour for about two and a half hours. And all of the other fathers packed these really sleek, low-profile tents that were made for this sort of weather, and they pitched them so they knew where the wind was coming. You know, these are, these are real men, okay? <laughs> well, I brought my huge five-man family tent, as tall as I could get it, you know? I had it staked in the ground with my little six-inch plastic pegs, <laughs> and Booker and I were ready to sleep. And then about two in the morning, we woke up. All of the stakes are gone. The only thing holding the tent down is the weight of our body. And the tent is in our face, just flapping. <laughs> and we're freezing. And Booker says, Dad, what do we do? What do we do? Dad, what do we do? And I said, Booker, just try to go to sleep. That's all we can do. <laughs> Let's go to sleep. So Booker and I got about two hours of sleep that night and then found ourselves at 5.30 a.m. huddled around the campfire trying to make coffee. And Booker is actually interested in coffee for the first time in his life. <laughs> what does that taste like? It looks warm. It was rough. But we made it through the night. Booker got his merit badge. And on the way home the next day, I'm feeling bad and I'm thinking about how miserable that was and I'm about to apologize to Booker for how rough that night was and, and not packing the right tent or being more prepared 
And then I look at Booker and he's got a smile this big on his face. And I said, what are you smiling about? And he said, that was awesome. <laughs> Actually, so dang awesome, I think is what he said. <laughs> Where most of us, and by that I mean me, found misery, Booker found a memory. And one he'll remember, one I'll remember. Because for him, the main thing wasn't the weather, it wasn't the tent, it was just being with his dad camping. He found a memory that would have been impossible to make if he had lost his focus. If he had forgotten to keep the main thing, the main thing. Amen.